I was 33 years old, well over 400 pounds, and food was my prison. And then I learned that food had the answer to my questions, and my kitchen had the cure for my disease. When I was 400 plus pounds, and I, I don't have an exact number because I, I had actually blown past the scales that all had that, that weight limit. Life was all about the food. I was deeply struggling with a processed food addiction. There was this little voice inside me that said, if you don't do something, you will not make it to 40 years old. And that's when I really just fell in love with the idea of how can I be my best self? So I was fighting for me and fighting for my health. When I went plant-based, my whole relationship with food changed. I realized how much better I was feeling. I feel like I'm firing on all cylinders. That's magic to me. And the weight just sort of slowly melted away, which is something I never thought was possible. Now, food prepping for me is a joy. I celebrate the quality of the food. It's just very rewarding. Healing starts at home. Mine did. And so can yours. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marvis, and today I'm excited to welcome Dr. Rooney Bathnagar. How are you? I'm doing well, Lori. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. And I'm really excited to speak to you about your unique work and the how the environment impacts our health. And it sounds like there's many exciting projects and many rabbit holes I feel like we could go down, but could you give us a little bit of your background and how you came to find this type of work and become interested in it? Yes, I, I did my PhD in, in India, but then I did my training in the University of uh, Texas, the, at the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston. And my area of interest has always been uh, to study heart disease and particularly uh, cardiac physiology. I was trained to do cardiac electrophysiology and, and recording electrical currents from the heart. Uh, my area of interest was the pacemaker cells, and I always found them fascinating because they would oscillate on their own, and they have their own rhythmicity. So I was studying the underlying mechanisms, electrical currents, and so on. And as I worked more and more in the circles of people working with heart physiology into heart disease, that I uh, it sort of occurred to me that since this is such an important problem, that we really need to understand the real origins of the disease. Why do so many people have heart disease? And why is it that it remains, despite all the advances, the leading killer in this country and in many, many places in the world? So maybe there is something fundamental that we have uh, failed to understand about the nature of the disease. And so in, in that vein, as I probed uh, deeper, um, I came to the realization that maybe most of this disease originates from environmental factors. And I use that word broadly in the sense that uh, there are environmental exposures, there are environmental conditions, and then there are ways in which we interact with the environment that is seemed to me to be one of the main drivers of the disease. So then I've been working in this area uh, we call environmental cardiology for a long time. Hmm. So can you give us a little bit of background in the sense of what are those environmental factors and what you mean by how we interact with the environment and how it can affect us? As yes. Well? So I, I've been thinking of this in terms of sort of different concentric circles. So there's this real broad set of conditions, which you call the natural environment. And, and then nested within the natural environment are the social environments that we have social structures, social networks, and further embedding in, embedded in those social networks, our own personal environments. And so you hear a lot of people talking about social determinants of disease and so on. But even though you and I may live in the same city, we may have completely different environments depending upon how our personal environments are created, our houses, our families. And so no in two individuals living in the same community or the same city, even the same neighborhood have similar environments. So we have to understand all these complexities of different environments that we live in, um, particularly 
interesting is the role of the natural environment was usually ignored. And in the natural environment, of course, the most of the important features are something like uh, the cycles of night and day, right? So you, you have the circadian rhythms and we are all tied or tethered to these cycles and there is no deviation permitted. And so if you deviate from the cycles, you have health cost, And part of that could be heart disease, obesity, diabetes. The same is true for our relationship to the sun. We are, most people don't realize this, like plants, we need specific amounts of sunlight to flourish. And it's a very specific requirement that's irreplaceable with anything else. And so if we derive, deprive ourselves from these natural exposures, then that is a cost to a health. And then, of course, we have our uh, environments of social environments and social support structures, you know, access to medical care and all of that, which there is a lot of work on that. And then finally, there are these personal environments where we create the worlds that we live in, either by choice or by uh, chance, could be either that. And then even within that, we have personal choices of either we choose to smoke or drink or exercise or sleep well or you know or those sort of health behavior sort of thing that people used to call you know your um, lifestyle issues but those lifestyle issues are not entirely because of individual choice most of the time it's the larger environments of social structures and networks that dictate our set of choices and so we when we consider this whole continuum of environmental or in some sense, external exposure. That that explains maybe 80 to 90% of heart disease and diabetes and obesity. Mm. So the idea is then should, we should be looking at these rather than being stuck with just the biology, like which valve is wrong or which artery is mm -hmm. blocked and that sort of mm. thing. I agree. Oh, there's just absolutely true because my work really focuses on that personal environment, but we constantly speak to the other constructs around the world like around them like driving down for example just the road to go to work you may be inundated with signs for mcdonald's and burger mm -hmm. king and mm -hmm. so they're being influenced in so many ways that are outside of their control or the lifestyle that you grew up thinking was normal and healthy maybe isn't so yes yeah, so i'm totally understand that and i love that so where does your realm of work fall in in those circles of influence, where where do you particularly like to focus your work? Right, so we, we're trying to understand what are these larger non-personal domains that influence personal activity and choices. Just like you said, we have people here that come to the clinics and we say, you know, you need to exercise and you need to be physically active. Then we make cities in which we make it impossible for anybody to walk anywhere, right? And then we just keep on blaming and shaming people and say, you are obese and you don't exercise. So these are the larger structural issues that we need to address. And that's where we've been focusing our work mm -hmm. on rather than trying to persuade each individual, which is not, usually it's not an individual's fault. So whether it's advertisements of food or whether it's tobacco or alcohol or whether it's um, you know work environment, all of these structural issues are key determinants of health that have been overlooked. Mm. And, and so that's very focusing on one of the main areas of interest we have is the natural environment. And we think that one of the drivers of health and disease outcomes could be the natural surroundings that we have, uh, particularly green spaces and nature. And our interactions with nature is also a very primordial need and there isn't a way in which we can divorce ourselves from nature and then pretend to be healthy, mm -hmm. right? And yes. so we are trying to look at communities, particularly communities, the disadvantaged communities, what are their, uh, these natural resources they have, access to nature, access to green spaces, and how that might impact health. Mm. So what have you found in your research? Like, is there particular cities that you found as good examples or what what would you recommend or like yeah please tell us more like what are your what are you finding in your research yes. specifically? so so that's it is a still an ongoing activity there's little work that's been done in this area but there is still some really interesting findings and these relate to the urban green spaces which is 
what we are planning because that's where we spend most of our time living and sleep. I mean, we can go on a have a break and have a little sojourn in nature and say, oh, we spend a weekend in the mountains, but that's not most of how most of us live. And that's may not may or may not have lasting impact. So what are the natural conditions in which we live our everyday lives? So we found that, and others have, have reported that people who live in more green areas tend to live longer, tend to live healthier lives, uh, report lower levels of depression and anxiety, tend to be out and more often. And so this sort of natural environment encourages healthy lifestyle and living and also has um, effect that decreases the risk of disease. And uh, the problem is that people who are living in green spaces are generally better off socioeconomically. And so they are, they have much better health behaviors. So we're trying to disentangle the effect of socioeconomic factors from natural factors. One of the papers we just published a few months ago was looking at these 5 million uh, cancer survivors. So when you have a diagnosis of cancer and they're, they're registered and then we followed them for 12 years. And we found that people who live in greener cities tend to do better after cancer diagnosis than people who live in less green cities hmm. or less green areas around their houses. So uh, in exposure to green spaces can uh, prolong uh, survival after cancer, at least that's the associative uh, relationship we found. Uh, there is a 10 to 12% decrease in total mortality, you know, a 8 to 10% decrease in cardiovascular disease risk and cardiovascular deaths. Wow. So there was a very interesting study in here in North America, where we have northeastern part of the country, we had an infestation of the ash borer beetle, which is killing all the uh, ash trees. Mm. And, and we've lost millions and millions of ash trees. So a colleague of mine, he traced the, the spread of this uh, epi epidemic as the trees were dying, the risk of heart disease kept increasing in the communities. Mm. So it would mean that in communities where trees die, people die as well. Oh, wow. And and so we think that there is a strong association within the health and well-being of a community and the surrounding greenness in which they live. Mm. Is do you know what cities you'd you'd prescribe for best health as far as being green cities? Is there any particular areas? Well, there, well, there are many cities that are quite green in the United States. The 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 tragic part is that almost all, all, most cities are green only in one part oh. and not the other. And mm. so if you go in, for example, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. And so if you go to the east end of the city, it's one of the greenest cities you'll ever come to. But if you go to the west end of the city, you know, you might as well be in Phoenix, right? Mm. So there's no trees, there are no shrubs, there are no bushes. So there's the intercity gradients are so much greater than intracity gradients. Wow. Oh, goodness. And so is there something that anyone can do also in their home that, you know, because we have this micro environment here, out, even outside, you know, within our walls, and then there's the outside, yes. anything in particular, like a number of plants or things that we should be thinking about that we could make our homes even conducive to better health in that sense. Right. So one way of improving health is, is uh, income. So if you increase a, a person's income, the health increases. That's what we've seen very, very uh, graded response. So putting one tree in your house, so your back or front yard, is equal to improving your income by twelve to fifteen thousand dollars. Really? Yes. And and so that means that if you have a large tree in the front of your back of your house, that has important bearing on your 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 health. And and we still do not know quite why. We think that part of what trees do is shield houses from air pollution. And we've done several studies showing that exposure to things like volatile chemicals like benzene, toluene, xylene, all these things uh, that people are, are exposed to, the exposures are much lower in green spaces. You know, mm -hmm. there are lower levels of anxiety, lower levels of depression, and you know, even you have lower energy consumption mm -hmm. in houses which have trees. So there are these variety of different possible hypotheses, but we had to figure out 
to what extent each of these relationships contribute to the overall beneficial effects of greenness. That is really fascinating because um, I went down a rabbit hole. <laughs> one, it's, it's one of my many things I get to do on this podcast um, and discovered horticultural therapy. And yeah. the reason I even found this was there was a young woman in New York who, um, <clears throat> excuse me, she was actually a professional model, beautiful young woman, mm -hmm. but she had like 1400 plants in this mm -hmm. apartment <laughs> in New York. And she wrote a book, but what was interesting is on her social media accounts, she started encouraging others to bring plants in. And they were talking about how their moods changed mm -hmm. literally from yes depressed state to this and I was like this is so fascinating right and it was a, such a fun thing to interview her and discuss and and then I found the horticultural therapist that she wrote about <laughs> like I literally went down this really interesting path because I didn't ever had never even heard of horticultural yes. therapy and I'm a physician I was like right. amazing right. so we, we don't we, we don't know the details so we need to elevate this relationship to more rigorous science so mm -hmm. that physicians like you and other understand the value. The only way we can do it is to quantify the benefits. So in order to mm -hmm. do that, we launched a program or a project, it's called the Green Heart Project. And what we are doing in this project, uh, which is almost halfway through now, is that we will we go and we evaluate the uh, level of air pollution in neighborhood we look at the risk of heart disease in that neighborhood. And then we plant large established trees because if you plant small trees, it's gonna take you know, 30 years for the study to complete. So you plant large established trees and, and to date we, we sort of planted over 8,000 mature trees in an area of like two square miles. Wow. And, and, these <laughs> tree, yeah, and these trees are some 20, 30, 40 foot trees. They're not like little oh saplings. Goodness, oh wow. And, and then we have an area which we, we didn't plant the trees. So it's like a controlled clinical trial. It's funded by the National Institutes of Health who say, okay, we'll fund other clinical studies, but you're not buying your trees. So we went to the nature. <laughs> yeah, so NIH is not in the business of buying trees. So, okay. <laughs> so we went to the Nature Conservancy. And so they're supporting all the greening. That's fantastic. And it is a, and that's why, because it's a very expensive project. It's like about, you know, $15 million project. Can I imagine? Just, yeah, yeah, you can put all those trees and around the, and they have to, we are trying to look at the placement where the tree should be placed next to the freeway, next to your house. So I think um, the idea that we could do an experiment as sort of an intervention, mm -hmm. and it would be a, a clinical trial that, you know, physicians like you would understand the value of a clinical trial right. where the intervention is not a pill, but a tree, mm. right? And see what the, and then measure, use the same rigorous methodology to measure the outcomes like we do in oh. any clinical trial. I am very, when will this conclude and when, when and where can we expect the results to uh, be published? So we have some results from the cross-sectional data already, which we have published. So we know that people live in green spaces in the neighborhood have much better health outcomes or poorer exposure to, or less exposure to volatile chemicals. Um, we just finished up planting this uh, summer. So we're going to follow next year and, and the year wow. following. And I hope the project never ends because the one thing with the trees is they just keep growing, don't they? So, yeah. so there is a 20% increase in the greenness of the area every year. And wow. so we can chart the health of the community as the greenness increases in the area. That is fun. I mean, those lucky people. Is this in Louisville? Yes, Does this in happen? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. They're lucky those in the, that square two miles. Eight yeah. The, the, our, our community <laughs> has been very, very involved and engaged in oh, that. Wow. We, so we went to house to house and door to door asking people if they would take trees from us. And and some people, of course, say we don't want to bother with trees. They get out mm. of you know. But some people are, <laughs> were, were very surprised. They're like nobody. I, I mean, what's what's the catch? You know, so when there is no catch. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very often that someone comes like, hey, can I come plant this 30, 40 foot tree in your that's yard? That. Yeah. That's <laughs> well, that's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, the value. Well, we all understand. Just even walking in nature, you feel calmer and more yes. relieved going to the ocean. I mean, that's one of the reasons I loved Colorado. Uh -huh. 
-huh. but year round, you know, there's only so much snow and cold you can take, but here in California, like the oceans there, I'm in Southern Orange County, it's like trees, you're, it's gonna be warmer. Year -round. I am so tickled to be yes. here. <laughs> and, and the reason that some people believe that there's a, there's a hypothesis called the biophilia <laughs> hypothesis. Hmm. It is, it says that we evolved in green and natural environments. And that if and that we had this sort of an indissoluble bond with the, with nature that we cannot live without nature, mm -hmm. and and the and it has uh, mental effects like if you go out like you, you said you know it relaxes you. If you pay if you talk to people and you're in the house you have to pay attention to everything that's artificial around you, but mm -hmm. if you interact with nature, it's an effortless attention. You don't have to pay attention to any part of nature. You're just there, mm -hmm. right? And, and that sort of rejuvenates and recharges your attention. And, and so that's why I interact with nature is so critical. There are lots of, there's a big literature in, in mental stress and tension and, and also anxiety, depression, even suicide rates are lower in greener areas, mm. right? So there's a lot of work there, but we were looking for whether we can find some measurable uh, physical effects that we can mm. quantify. Hmm. So I'm, I'm curious as to what do you feel the mechanism is for heart disease in particular, and this environmental, you know, exposure, is there, is, are there certain endocrine effects or hormonal effects or like, mm -hmm. where is that breakdown occurring? And then how quickly does it take to get better if we move to greener spaces? I mean, is there do you have any way to quantify that or give a yeah. quote unquote prescription for someone to understand? Well, so the, the, uh, the reason I got into this greenness uh, research was uh, my interest in heart disease. And one of the leading causes of heart attacks now, which is, is a small risk, but is with so, among so many people, is exposure to air pollution. And, mm. and there are, you know, 7 million premature deaths per year worldwide because of air pollution. And of those, 80% are caused by cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, mm. and so on. So that, when we first uh, got the data, it was very surprising because we thought that most of the deaths due to air pollution were lung-related deaths, but that's not true. It's all, it's all heart disease. Oh. So when, when we, and we can see that. So if you have cities like whether it's Boston or whether it's New York, you see an increase in the rates of air pollution, then within six hours, you see increased deaths from heart disease and hospital admissions. Oh, wow. So, so there is a very immediate effect. And then there's a long-term effect that if you live in more polluted areas, you have a greater progression of what we call atherosclerosis and atherosclerotic mm -hmm. lesion formation. And so that's what I've been studying. And, and, and so, what we thought that, you know, since there is very little we can do with air pollution, we lowered a lot of air pollution in our country, but we still have cars and there are still neighborhoods, you know, that, especially in the Midwest and here and, you know, the freeways going through people's neighborhoods and when they were first made. So what can uh, we as a community do? So that's where we got into green spaces. So one of the mechanisms by which green spaces may be uh, promoting health is by decreasing exposure to air pollution. Hmm. So that would be one mechanism. The other we are seeing is that maybe there is some association with improving sleep quality. You live in more greener spaces, you have better sleep for some reason. One of a very, very early hypothesis we are pursuing is that trees emit all sorts of volatile chemicals. And when we inhale them, for example, in pinene and limonene, that lowers your blood pressure and your heart rate and has direct physiological effects on, on your vascular function. Mm. And so that may be one of the mechanisms. But in order to sort out, we have to do something which we were talking about, like an interventional trial to mm. figure out each of these mechanisms. Mm. That is really fascinating. So, I mean, when I think about you know, exposure. So we just moved into a home. I've always had electric stoves, but now mm -hmm. I have a gas stove here. Um, mm -hmm. I've been here literally like six days <laughs> at our new <laughs> our house. And, you know, I'm just curious about what's, when I'm using natural gas stove, is there any concerning toxic elements that I need to be worried about? Like, should I try to get this turned back to an electric stove? So, cause I haven't dealt with that. And I know there can be some, some yes. things. I think there was a, there was a recent study within a few months or weeks, a few weeks ago, and they were saying that there are there is some residual risk exposure ex associated with gas cooking, hmm. and that the electric 
the heating is is safer but okay. but but cooking in general i don't know most people don't realize if the the cooking is a very uh, rich source of of these uh, fine and ultra fine particles so when you cook over open wok they have uh, you you breathe in those particles that causes cardiovascular issues and the cardiovascular uh, disease is much higher in cooks than most other people because of really? constant exposure to yeah so if you're cooking in an open wok and you see all these fine particles you can see the mist coming out all those oh, wow. are are actually small particles that lodge into your lung and cause issues for inflammation in the lung and that spreads to the heart and the blood vessels wow. so that's a, an important source of um of, of, of cardiovascular disease risk so you're right i mean in in and we have uh electric uh, stoves we never had gas here in, mm. Uh, mm. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. And then, you know, electric, <laughs> there's electric dryer downstairs too. So yeah. I'm like, I've never had that either. It's like, <laughs> so I'm not sure. Well, that gives me some food for thought. I'm going to go do some research on that. <laughs> so maybe, maybe doing some renovation in the kitchen. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but, but it's always a good idea to keep your exhaust open. Don't mm -hmm. don't just look directly into the the cooking wok and mm -hmm. and try try and have minimized exposure that way. I mean, the other sources of exposure too, for example, burning candles and incense indoors, mm -hmm. is 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 a very high so uh, emitter. Those are very high emitters of these particles and fine particles. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, there are these cleaners uh, that we use and other sort of chemicals. So in most homes that we have seen, the indoor air is actually far worse than the outdoor air, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so that's a much greater threat than the general pollution that we hear about. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I can definitely see that, especially with mm. cleaners or if you like an ant infestation and then you're using other type of uh, insecticides and other yeah. things. I mean, there's all sorts of things. When you, moving into a home or leaving a home, I certainly become acutely aware of that because you're using things to get it clean and prepped for moving in or out. Um, it just, yeah, it definitely makes you start thinking. And then, or how your animal reacts. Like, cause we have a, a dog and if you spray something and she's sniffing yeah. and sneezing and yeah. you know, you're thinking, what am I doing to this animal who lives by aroma? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, then, and then it would have the same effect on people as well as yeah. you have in dogs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but and then people have tried to study whether indoor plants are going to clean up indoor air. But I think mm. the jury's still out on that. We don't know. Maybe it takes a lot of plants, like your friend, maybe a few hundred <laughs> plants. <inside. laughs> but but in, in but in in there are but you know NASA did put out a list of ten plants that are most active in cleaning away mm. the indoor air. But there's very little evidence supporting that they make a significant difference. Mm. But they are. They do have that green effect, though, right? They are the the living. I'm, so I'm curious about like in the home, then what about like air purifiers and those type of things? Are those a waste of money or is that something worth looking and in investing in? So if you have filters, if you have an HVAC in your central air and heating, mm -hmm. then, then putting filters in those makes sense. With mm -hmm. the problem with this air purifiers, when they are local, then it's they only cleans up a little bit of air and you know, you're not there all the time. So mm -hmm. I don't know how effective those are. But uh, certainly they could be good when you're sleeping because that's one time that mm -hmm. we think the exposure makes a big difference. And one of the, the, the results we had was that people who live in more polluted environments have poorer sleep quality. Hmm. And, and so cleaner air promotes better sleep. And mm -hmm. so if you can have these air purifiers that the bedroom environment is so critical, and if air purifiers in your bedroom, that might help you, you know, sleep better and have lower levels of pollution. But in general, having HEPA filters and installing those UV lamps to kill off any microorganisms in the lines of your... Mm -hmm air conditioning units that helps gotcha yeah and uh, yes the other thing is getting these ducts cleaned out as yeah, well mold that. mildew yeah. those type of things wow so that is fascinating so when if we go back and step outside literally <laughs> to um <clears throat> are there any things that people can do in their own communities to make things better is there is there someone in like they should be looking to to speak to about the walkability or like who should someone contact or like you know we want to make our space here while they're still living in this wherever yeah. they are in their environment like who should they be looking to contact in this type of arena so i mean 
the, the advice is, is very old and ancient. So if you really want to make a world better, just plant a tree. That's where you all begin. I think gotcha. it makes it having a tree in your backyard, a front yard makes a big difference. Sometimes here, you know, trees are nuisance. I mean, they shed leaves and you have to maintain them, whatever. There's a little bit of care, but like, that's what we do with the pets and that's what we do with other things, living things. So trees are, uh, yeah. Children. And so, yeah. And children, oh, that, that's a whole different story. <laughs> this, tree, trees don't take that much attention and they're not so, they're not so annoying at all. Um, so, so, the, the, so we need to do that. We need to, to figure out what are our fundamental rights as a neighborhood. So what makes a healthy mm. neighborhood? And so that we need to work together as a community. I'm sure you have, you know, the community organizations within the places where people live and you can talk to people, say the greening should be a priority, having clean air, not having you no know, sources of traffic go through the neighborhood and walkable space. There are actually analyses that you can do and other people can do uh, about the walkability of the area that you live in. And so uh, if you more people are outside, especially you know during COVID, lots of people were outside and spending time in the nature, mm -hmm. and being outside is critical so that you can spend time there. We have also found interestingly that you know one of the mechanisms by which uh, greenness can improve health is by promoting social cohesion and mm -hmm. social interactions. So you go out, you 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 talk to people, you're running or doing whatever outside. You feel better, and, and mm -hmm. you know your your blood pressure comes down, and so your risk overall in many years will come down if you have better social contacts. Mm -hmm. So, so being part of the community, do that. Be be careful about what sort of uh, sources of pollution are there in your neighborhood, right? And so that's very important. But things like that we have had, we partly overcome the problem. For example, lead, and we have lots of people in the east where they have lead in their pipes mm -hmm. and it, it's the water from the city is cleaned but you get contamination so it's very easy i think here it's a free program you can call up the city government ask for lead testing in your drinking water mm -hmm. right or you can ask for less the testing of lead and other things in the paints and so on mm -hmm. there are companies that would you can do for a small fee get the fungal evaluation of how much whether there's fungal infestation in your house Mm -hmm. So if you maintain, I think I think that's having a clean house is so critical to having a healthy life. Mm, that is really interesting. I'll do some thinking and research on <laughs> being in a new space. It's an older home, right? So then yeah, it, yeah. you think about um, all the things that you don't think about in a newer place. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> excuse me again. Sorry, I was apologizing before we started, but the 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 COVID is a yeah. <laughs> getting over that and clearing my throat on a continual basis. Um, excellent. So then where do you see like future research going? Um, is there any other projects online other than what you're already currently working on? I mean, I feel like there's just so many. <laughs> I have been, so many avenues to, so many call. avenues to, so many avenues to pursue. So, no, no. So the thing is we are doing this as a test case and the overall idea is that if we can understand which trees to what density, mm. at, at what placement, and in what shapes are ideal for urban greenness, then we can create you know, blueprint or, or if you were a green print for how to build healthier cities in the future. Mm. We also need to understand that these impacts are not just in isolation, right? Everything in a social structures are connected. So there is a strong, um, environmental justice and health equity issue that we cannot deprive some communities of you know clean living conditions and green urban environments right. so we need to work on that but more critically that for us as investigators and as physicians and scientists it's important to understand that there is a direct contribution of the natural elements to our health whether they are circadian rhythms or green spaces whether it's sunlight but we really don't understand specifically, you know, for example, how much exposure sunlight we should have. And not many people understand that. And it varies with your latitude and your season and your skin color and lots of other things. And, and so we need to work all of that out and relate it to why it affects the risk of heart disease. So ultimately, we want to be able to explain these interactions with nature on a molecular and cellular basis. Mm. Yeah, I would love to be able to write a prescription and say, I need you to get this much sunlight in the morning, this in the evening. 
Yeah, yes, you know, but this is they, your they, Lipitor. <laughs> yeah, no, vitamin, I know. So vitamin in. <laughs> they, they do. They, they do sometimes, and now they're trying to have physician write a prescription. You just spend thirty minutes in the park every day. Mm -hmm. And and I'll tell you an interesting story. This is from London, where they did exp a randomized experiment in people with heart failure, right? And they had a group of people walk in Hyde Park, and another group of people walk in Oxford Street, which is a very busy street in, in London. And they mm -hmm. compared, and people who walked in the Hyde Park had better uh, parameters and controls of the heart failure diagnosis than uh, and, and the cardiac function. Uh, and this effect lasted for about two weeks after spending an hour in the park. Wow. And, and the people who walked on Oxford Street saw their heart failure conditions worsen within a couple of days, oh my. right? So, so it's, it's such an interesting... Uh, concept that as physicians, and if you're dealing with people with chronic illnesses, whether it's cancer diagnosis, whether it's heart failure, that maybe it may not be a large effect, but it may be even if it's a small effect, that we should encourage interaction with nature and that could be beneficial to our health. Well, and I guess it depends too on the time too, right? Because these small incremental exposures over time can have a substantial yeah. impact, I would imagine, just like Somebody eating one vegetable one time versus eating one vegetable every day is going right. to have a quantitative effect. Right. Awesome. So there is a company that's making an app, and I think it's out, is that when you write a prescription for your patients, you could look up what is the closest park to their place. Oh. And then you can tell them, please spend 30 minutes in the park next to you. Oh, that's every, fantastic. Uh, the, yes. Uh, my, minority says eat more vegetables, get more sleep, decrease stress. So I'm just going to add... The vitamin in for nature. Yes, right. as well. yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. You take your daily supplement. Well, this is fantastic. So I'm excited to read about the Green Heart Program, and I can't wait to see what those results are. Oh, my goodness. It just sure, sounds thank fabulous. You. Oh, geez. Yeah. Fantastic. We had, if you want to see a little bit what it looks like, there was... Um, a PBS NewsHour uh, 10 minute special on the Green Heart Project. You should see that. Okay. Uh, if you just put PBS and Green Heart Louisville, you would see you, the, you, the video would come up. So they, they came here, they did a whole survey how we're planting the trees, what we are studying, and met with our neighbors here and what it means to them. It was a really nice 10 minute piece. So. That's fantastic. No, I will be watching that as soon as we're <laughs> concluded. Yeah, sure. absolutely. Sure. This is fantastic. So well, this has been absolutely fun. I knew it would be fascinating talking to you. And I feel like there could be so much more. I can't, like I said, I just, there's so many things about nature that are just, it just, you know, just talking about it, honestly, makes me excited. <laughs> and, um, but I am excited for people like yourself who are doing the, this really important research because it is a very neglected field and mm -hmm. yet one that's mm -hmm. so powerful and, and important. And so any final words you'd like to share with our audience? No, I'm uh, only that, you know, we cannot sever our bonds with nature. We just have to learn to live. And, and it is, I know sometimes nature could be problematic, right? So there are snakes and scorpions and, you know, <laughs> what are leeches, but we have, but there, we don't have a choice. That's but we, we are part of it. We're not like a separate entity. We are nature. We didn't someone plopped into the into nature like this, but we have organically grown out of it. So mm. we should sort of value that bond. Yes, absolutely. And it's only meant there to be there to make us healthier. So it's, yes. it's not something to be fought and yes. turned against. That's fantastic. Well, thank you again. This was absolutely lovely. And everyone, I hope you enjoyed this, but go check it out. We'll put the links to the PBS 10 minute special as well. And I'm excited to uh, for everyone to hear this message is it's just another reason to go outside and take a walk. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed that video. Before you go though, please hit the subscribe and alert buttons so you don't miss out on any of the amazing content we're working so hard to provide you. We upload a new episode of Health and More with Dr. Lori Marbus every Friday. Now, if you'd rather listen to the podcast, you can find us on all the major platforms such as iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, and even Spotify. If you're looking for amazing resources to help you start and sustain a plant-based diet, exercise, recipes, or anything wellness, we got you covered there too. Because at Mora, we actually provide physician-led support groups to help people live happier, healthier lives free of metabolic disease. Don't forget to check out our website at mora.com 
and thanks again for watching.